Thank you and good morning. Uh, I'm not sure the organizers realize that I'm not a marketing person. Uh, I came in under the radar as an economist, kind of a health economist. Uh, so I'm not exactly sure why I'm here, but I guess they thought that my presentation was a matter of life and death, which it is. <laughs> and they also thought that the best customer is a living customer, and uh, therefore longevity is important. And finally, uh, they realized that I, like many people in the room, uh, my hobby is torturing the data till they confess. So <laughs> that's what I'm doing here. Um, here, here's a kind of a starting point. Uh, the measure of longevity that I'm going to analyze, uh, a little bit unusual. We, we normally hear about life expectancy, like life expectancy at birth. Um, and uh, I'll say more about that in a minute. But uh, what I measure here is mean age at death. So we have a death certificate for every person. The, the death certificate indicates the age at death and the cause of death. So if we just sort of look at death certificates that are filed in a given year, we can look at how old people are when they die. Completed duration of life for all you uh, duration people. Um, and, and that went up by about a year and a half between 2000 and 2009 in France. Not, not monotonically, but it did go up. Um, and what I want to do in this uh, study is to test the hypothesis that part of that increase was due to the introduction and use of new drugs. Um, and uh, I'm not going to, uh, I'll get back to the highlights later. Uh, let me summarize uh, several decades of economic growth theory in about three slides. Uh, and, and first of all, I would say that uh, uh, economists are increasingly recognizing that if you think about long run economic growth, that that consists not only of GDP growth, what we usually hear about from the Commerce Department, but longevity growth as well. After all, in 1900, life expectancy in the United States was about 50. Now it's about 78. So people live about 28 years longer than they did 100 years ago. And uh, economists believe that that's very valuable. In fact, uh, William Nordhaus here at Yale argued that to a first approximation, the value of increased longevity over the 20th century is about as large as the value of GDP growth. So when we think about sort of growing prosperity, we should realize that improvements in health and longevity are, are a very big part of that. Where does this come from? What are the sources of economic growth? Well, uh, again, to, at the risk of oversimplification, uh, Robert Solo, Nobel laureate at MIT, established back in the 1950s that the primary source of economic growth is technological progress. Without new technology, uh, economic growth would, would grind to a halt. Uh, but there are two different flavors of technological progress. There are what is called embodied and disembodied technological progress. Suppose that somebody comes up with a new discovery. The question is, how are people going to benefit from that discovery? One possibility is I could simply hear about it on the radio and say, gee, that's a wonderful new idea, and I could benefit simply by hearing about it or reading about it. That would be so-called disembodied technological progress. However, I think the evidence indicates that most technological progress is embodied in new goods and services. The only way to benefit from innovation is to actually use products like computers and drugs and airplanes and so forth that embody those inventions. Um, and so uh, most technological progress is, uh, is embodied in new goods. Um, and where, in fact, does technological progress come from? Well, uh, we, uh, it was originally conceived that it was just sort of like manna from heaven, that technological progress just happened automatically. We now realize that technological progress is endogenous, that it's primarily the result of investment in research and development by both the private sector and the public sector, such as by the National Institutes of Health. So technological progress is driven by R&D, um, and that, that's where it's coming from. So who does the most R&D? I'm glad you asked that, because, <laughs> because the, the answer is, according to the National Science Foundation, the medical substances and devices industry, this is on the metric of R&D, the R&D to sales ratio. Uh, and so by far, uh, the biomedical sector is the most research intensive industry in the economy, more than the computer industry, more than the aircraft industry. 
It's really uh, the biomedical sector. And within the biomedical sector, pharmaceuticals are the most research intensive. Uh, in 2007, prescription drugs accounted for about 10% of health expenditure, but it's estimated that more than half of US funding for biomedical research came from pharmaceutical and biotechnology firms. Moreover, a lot of the rest is done by the NIH, and in, an, uh, in a paper I published a couple of years ago, we demonstrate that new drugs often build on upstream government research. We can look at patent citations and so forth, and so uh, a huge amount of biomedical R&D is either done by the industry or done by the government and relied upon by industry. Um, now, uh, I, want to, I want to assess the impact of pharmaceutical innovation on longevity. Uh, how do you do that? You have to measure pharmaceutical innovation. There are two different ways, I believe, of doing that. One is to measure what I call the vintage of drugs. Suppose I, I went into your house, I went into the bathroom and opened the medicine cabinet, and I looked at all the bottles of medicine that you were taking. And the question is, are you taking medicines that were uh, invented in the 1950s and the 1970s or in the last 10 years? And I hypothesize that if you're taking newer medicines, you are likely to be in better health, other things being equal, than if you're taking old medicine. So the vintage of the drugs, the year of invention of drugs. Now, in this particular paper, I don't have data on drug vintage. And what I'm going to measure is the number of drugs for treating a particular condition. Uh, and I'll show you some data on that in a minute. That is, over time, new drugs are introduced so that there are more treatment options. Uh, there, are, there are more uh, ways of treating a condition. Uh, and uh, now, an economist named Paul Romer uh, at Stanford uh, argued that, uh, that basically prosperity depends on how many ideas have been developed in the past, on the stock of ideas. In fact, that paper has been cited 14,000 times. I wish I could write a paper that would be cited 14,000 <laughs> times. Um, and, um, and so I'm going to rely on this idea of the number of ideas. And in fact, well, just uh, for a moment, when we look at drugs, there are, drugs can be classified. There's a hierarchical classification uh, that was uh, uh, developed by the World Health Organization. If we look at a drug for diabetes, metformin, that's down at the bottom, that's within a chemical subgroup of biguanides, and, and so there's this hierarchy of drugs. If we look at data on France, uh, from 1995 to 2010, and in the right-hand column, we, we ask how many drugs were, it had been introduced in France but in 1995, there were 1,800 molecules on the market, like Lipitor is a molecule. By 2010, there were 2,400 molecules. So about 42 new molecules were introduced per year during that 15-year period. And the question is, you know, are, are people going to live longer, or how much longer are people going to live as a result of those new drugs? That's the sort of the question that I ask. Now, uh, instead of looking at how many drugs there are, you could look at how many classes of drugs there are. Because there is the view that, you know, there's a lot of me too drugs. And once you, there's a particular drug class developed, it doesn't really matter if there are additional drugs within the same class. Uh, I can test that. Um, so I can look at the impact of the number of drugs for a disease versus the number of classes of drugs for the disease and see which matters more. Um, and so what I do in this study uh, is I look at the impact of pharmaceutical innovation um, on, um, on longevity, that is mean age at death, but I also want to look at its impact on expenditure. That is, I want to look at the costs of new drugs uh, as well as their benefits. The cost of new drugs, to think about that, is not only how much the drugs cost, but there may be cost offsets or savings, such as reduced hospitalization, as a result of the introduction of new drugs. So I'm going to uh, look at the impact on age at death, on the use of hospitals, and on pharmaceutical expenditure. And uh, by combining those estimates, 
I can estimate the holy grail of health economists, the cost per life year gain. That is, okay, we can make people live longer, but it costs money. And the question is, how much does it cost per year of life gain? Uh, I'm going to estimate that. Um, okay, so I already mentioned Romer. Here's an example of what I can do using a very rich database uh, that the French government developed. Here's a particular disease, melanoma, which I hope no one has. Um, and what I can do is I can reconstruct the history of innovation for melanoma. Uh, the first drug uh, that, was, that, uh, that is currently used to treat melanoma was commercialized in France in 1959. I can go back to about 1900. And we can observe all of the drugs that are currently approved or recognized to, to, to treat melanoma. And I can do that for lots of different diseases. And when I hear some illustrative data for about six diseases, and I just sort of chose these because they all started with roughly the same number of drugs in 2000. They all had about 65 or 70 drugs. These are at a fairly aggregate level, these diseases. One can drill down and then there would be a smaller number of drugs. But you can see that in a sense the number of drugs, uh, there's sort of, there's different rates of innovation for different diseases. For some diseases, uh, there's been more new drugs introduced than others. And my hypothesis is that essentially uh, the, the, the more innovation there is for a disease, the greater the improvement in outcomes for people with that disease. That is mean age of death in particular. So that's what I'm testing in my, in my model. And here, here are some, here are about the 10 largest causes of death in France. So we have, we, uh, you know, the number one is heart disease, about 50,000 deaths per year. We can calculate from the death certificates the mean age of death in 2000 and 2009 and in the intervening years. And I can also calculate how many drugs there were for treating that disease by, by that year. How many drugs have been introduced in the past for treating each disease? Uh, and that's quite heterogeneous. So some diseases, there's almost no innovation. The number of drugs barely increased. But others, there was significant innovation, like uh, colon cancer, the uh, malignant neoplasms of digestive organs, the number three disease. There were nine new drugs um, something like a 30% you know, increase in the number of drugs for treating that. So what I'm going to do is really quite simple. I'm going to uh, analyze the correlation across diseases between the change in the number of drugs for the disease and mean age of death. Now, I'm going to allow for lags because one would expect there to be a substantial lag from new introduction to mean age of death for two reasons. First of all, new drugs diffuse gradually. A drug gets approved this year, but it's not going to be widely used for, say, five or 10 years. Um, and second, drugs for chronic conditions, which account for most drug use, may have to be consumed for several years for their full health benefits to be realized. People have to be, say, on statins for several years before their risk of stroke or cardiovascular disease uh, decline. So I'm going to allow, and I expect there to be lags. Now, one, one sort of uh, pitfall, potential pitfall of my analysis is I'm looking at the effect of new drugs for a disease on age of death from that disease. But suppose that there's a miracle new drug that, in a sense, that as a result, no one dies from that disease anymore. They, desire, they die from something else. That's called competing risks. You have to die from something. But if a uh, treatment is very effective, you might die from a different disease instead. Now that, and I cannot capture that in my analysis. However, I did a calculation which suggests that most of the increase in mean age of death is actually due to within disease increase, not between disease. It's not that people are dying from different diseases. That only accounts for 20% of the increase in life expectancy or mean age of death. Most of the gain is within disease. So I'm, I'm analyzing the 80% of, of uh, increase that's within disease. Um, by the, um, I am looking at mean age of death. This is a slightly unusual measure of life expectancy. 
life expectancy cannot be uh, measured on a disease-specific basis, but if you look across countries at the correlation between mean age at death and life expectancy at birth, there's a pretty strong correlation. So I'm reasonably confident that uh, uh, th this is a, a, a good measure of longevity. Well, I'm not going to show you my equations. I, I, I took the warning literally, and I'm just going to tell you the result. And, and, and when I estimate my difference in differences model, uh, um, what, uh, the, uh, and I get a variety of estimates, but sort of the central tendency, the mean of the estimates of the, of the uh, nine-year longevity increase attributable to pharmaceutical innovation is about three and a half months which is only about 20% of the total increase in longevity. So, gee, I can only explain 20%. But even if that 20% is right, that's still a pretty big deal. Uh, and I think that estimate is probably conservative. My estimates also indicate that there is a lag and that the mean lag between the introduction of a new drug and the impact on age of death is about 10 years. So a new drug gets introduced today that will reduce the age at which people die from the disease about 10 years from now, primarily due to uh, diffusion, to the uh, gradual diffusion of new products. Um, now, as I mentioned, I, I wanted to look at the, is it the number of drugs for a disease or is it the number of mechanisms of action, the number of classes of drugs? What I find is overwhelmingly that longevity is much more strongly related to the number of drugs than it is to the number of drug classes. So all this stuff you hear about, a lot of Me Too drugs, they don't do anything, that's not what I find. Now one possible explanation for that is that the number of drugs in a class may reflect how important or valuable that class is. Somebody may come up with a new mechanism of action but if it turns out, you know what, this really isn't that promising, there won't be a lot of subsequent entry into that class. So it may be capturing that. It's also the case that the first drug in a class is not necessarily and may not usually be the most important. For example, statins, lovastatin was the first statin, but that drug was clearly superseded by later statins such as simvastatin and atorvastatin. Now, I also said I, I wanted to look at hospital utilization. So I have data for France, annual data, on how many people are hospitalized for different diseases over time. Uh, and I find that essentially the diseases where there were the most new drugs introduced saw the greatest decline in the number of hospitalizations and the number of days spent in the hospital. And, it, and I estimate that Pharmaceutical innovation during uh, a, a slightly longer period, 2000 to 2010, reduced the number of hospital days in 2010 by about 9.3%. So that new drugs are reducing the rate of hospitalization by about 1% per year. Again, there is, a, there is a, a significant lag. Now, of course, the introduction of new drugs does drive up drug spending. New drugs cost more than old drugs. And I also estimate that the increase in the number of chemical substances increased pharmaceutical spending by about 26%. So that's sort of, uh, that's the, the sort of uh, the effect on pharmaceutical spending. Well, when I put this all together in a slightly non-user friendly table, uh, he, here's, what, here's what I'm doing. And um, so in the first column of numbers, I'm showing the actual values of these variables in France in 2009. So on average, people died at about 77 years old. And, and down below, I look at how much what the average spending in US dollars on drugs, about $600 per year um, um, on hospitals and other medical expenditure. Um, I, and then I do, I do the counterfactual. What if there had been no pharmaceutical innovation for 10 prior years? Well, people would have lived about three and a half months shorter, but they would have spent less on drugs, about $125 less per person. However, they would have spent more on hospitals. Um, and so from that, I can determine the cost per life year gain. 
Um, and what I estimate is that the cost per life year gained was about $8,000. Um, and I think if you ask yourself, would I be willing to spend $8,000 to live an extra year? You'd probably say yes, and uh, the, the evidence suggests that, that people do say that. I believe I'm out of time, so I will stop there. Thank you.